Hey, what up? It's Brad. Welcome to my 48 video series on the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Uh, I came across this book on a recommendation actually from uh, a random business person who I started following on Instagram and I was extremely skeptical upon starting to read this book, especially with the way that the author Robert Greene introduces the book. Basically, he lays out what he's going to talk about, obviously, which is power. And he defines why, well, one, what power is, and two, why it's important. And basically, he states that although it is a dirty, kind of um, not so pretty area of life, understanding how power works and how to appropriately wield it is extremely important for anyone really who wants to do anything in life at all. So you are someone who wants to accomplish certain things in your life, there's certain things you want to see happen, and understanding how power dynamics and these specifically 48 laws of power apply to what you're trying to do is extremely critical. Uh, and before you explicitly see them laying out, you probably kind of understand implicitly, you know, you have some level of implicit understanding just based on life events, what's going on to you, lessons you've learned, but you kind of understand how these operate in day-to-day -day life, but you probably don't have as nuanced an idea of what these laws are, how to apply them, and then how not to, uh, as the author says, transgress them, how to not break the laws. And if you do break the laws, what are the consequences? You know, letting, letting the author set those negative anchors was really powerful for me as a reminder to, yo bro, don't break these laws or this is going to happen to you. A lot of times the example is uh, actually death in the book, so maybe not as applicable as far as a consequence now, but in certain cases that does apply. So the in this video, we're gonna concern ourselves with the first law of power. And <clears throat> really, th this is a law that I actually struggled to um, come up with an application to present day life. You know, I, we're, we're talking in, uh, what is it, May of 2019. So in 2019, you know, we live in a very uh, like free entrepreneurial time and there aren't very many masters, so to speak. So the first law is never outshine the master. Now, if you're in 2019 and you're an entrepreneur, you're like, nobody's the fucking master of me. They can go fuck themselves. I do what I want. I run my own business, motherfucker. Uh, and I agree with that. I actually felt the same way when I heard the law, 100%. And so that tendency definitely is understandable. But I'll, I'll explain the law and then I'll circle back at the end of the explanation and tell you how it applies in certain situations in 2019 and forward and why this is still going to be an important law to abide by no matter what time period you're in. But let's talk about the actual um, transgression and then obeying the, the example that the author uses of someone who transgresses the law than someone who obeys the law. So he starts off with the transgression and uh, it's this basically this French guy, Fouquet, who was in Louis XIV's court and Fouquet, I believe, started as a minister of finance, uh, and then he actually moved up to be basically the king's right-hand man after the king's existing right-hand man died in some, uh, he was assassinated or some, some crazy thing. But uh, Fouquet, up to his appointment as the, I think it was the prime minister was the right hand of the king, something like that. Uh, right before he was appointed to that position, he actually felt that he was falling out of favor with the king because Fouquet was an extremely talented statesman. Uh, he really knew what he was doing and he was producing a lot of results. And although it was helping the court, it was actually making the king look like less of a star. It actually made Fouquet look like he was more valuable and a better statesman and just better at politics than actually Louis XIV, who was the, the reigning king. So when Fouquet gets appointed, uh, he's having his palace built and he throws this huge party in his brain to impress the king. So Louis XIV comes to the party, he's the guest of honor, he's honored, Fouquet does all these, he structures the night out to 
basically be you know spectacle after spectacle to in his mind honor the king and show him how much he respects and appreciates his new appointment as prime minister uh but what winds up happening is upon you know reflection we find out that louis the 14th was actually getting just more and more pissed at fouquet and becoming more and more insulted as the night went on so what winds up happening is I think it's uh, like 20 days later, the king actually has Fouquet arrested and then jailed for something like 20 years, almost the rest of his life. So Fouquet basically lives out the rest of his days in prison because although he thought that he was ingratiating himself to the king, he actually made the king feel self-conscious and he broke the first law of power, do not outshine a master. Now, Fouquet obviously was in a a courtesan's position and he was in a more feudal society to where someone could be jailed but just because you know the king felt like it he felt like putting you in jail in jail you go we don't live in quite the same dynamic as that in 2019 however there are some serious parallels that you need to be aware of as you're navigating your own life and uh, again i'll circle back to those at the end but let's talk about someone who obeyed the law and the example that robert green gives in the book is actually the astronomer and uh, I believe he's also a physicist, Galileo. And so what Galileo did is he actually discovered Saturn. So he, um, I believe Galileo built telescopes and he kept refining the telescope design until he could see further and further into space with higher and higher resolution. And so what he wound up doing is actually discovering the planet Saturn and I believe it's four moons. I think, I think Saturn has four moons. Apologies if I had the wrong planet or the wrong number of moons. But the, the punchline is what Galileo did is instead of announcing his discovery to the scientific community, he actually kept it quiet and he basically strategized to find a way to maximize the benefit to him. So here's what he did, this is super clever. Galileo realized that the Medici family, uh, I think it was Lorenzo de' Medici, was currently in power when Galileo made his discovery uh, and Lorenzo had four children. So what Galileo did is he realized, oh shit, four children, Medici family, super powerful. They have a bunch of stuff orbiting around them similar to the rings of Saturn. They have four children. I can turn this into basically a uh, kind of like a prophecy of the, uh, you know, an ex a cosmic example of the Medici's prowess. And I can attribute this to the gods saying that they are the premier family. And what I can do is I can turn this into a huge uh basically sponsorship or a um uh, the term escapes me a bit but basically where a powerful family would sponsor an, an artist or a scientist even you know if you can imagine back in the in the 14 or 1500s or whenever galileo lived i'm bad at math and history <laughs> when he lived he basically had to survive off of patrons there we go that's the word he had to survive off of patronage from royal families who would become his patrons, uh, but typically they would only give gifts, and it was pretty—it was a pretty meager way to make your living. Uh, the gifts typically were not high in monetary val value necessarily, and they couldn't be sold without insulting the giver, the offerer of the gift. So it was really a tough position for scientists, especially Galileo, because he's always short on cash. You know, he doesn't have anybody that's super rich. You know, really like keeping up his lifestyle. So what he says is, all right. I just made this discovery. There's this family who yeah, I can totally sync these two things up with. And so he actually basically creates a ceremony honoring the Medici's where he announces what he's discovered. He gives all the evidence for it. And he says how this honors the Medici family. He basically dedicated Saturn and its moons to the Medici family. And the result of that, because he humbled himself to the Medici's, which I mean, you gotta think about this. Like he literally discovered a planet. I mean, like the first person to ever see it. So, I mean, that like, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> he literally, it's like literally like, imagine you find an alien race and you dedicate it to Tony Robbins because he's like, the, you know, some shit like that. So super, super humbling of himself. He could have been like, I'm the best, I'm the best scientist there's ever been. You know, he could have totally gone like, you know, Showtime Lakers with it. But instead he decided to humble himself and give essentially the credit, not the credit necessarily, but he basically gave the glory, he gifted that to the Medici's and in return, they actually became his 
largest patron ever. He never really had to work for another family again for the rest of his life. And he lived in comfort from then on, as far as monetarily, and he still went on to discover a whole slew of other crap. I mean, you know how, who Galileo is. Um, so it didn't actually wind up diminishing his name that he dedicated it to somebody else. And that act of humbling himself and finding a master who he could humble himself before and not outshine and let them shine even brighter, brought him massive returns. So I really loved that example. As you can tell, I get pretty excited about it. I, I really resonated with, and I'm sure you do as well, if you've experienced this in your life, I really resonated with the idea of serving in order to gain. I love that idea. I think a lot of people really miss that in, <clears throat> in, in our 2019 culture of look out for you, you know, the self love, like you gotta be taking care of yourself, you gotta get yours, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you be an independent person, you don't have to work for the man anymore, it's 2019, we can be entrepreneurs, we can work for ourselves. But there's still a huge, massive component to success that is ingratiating yourself, and basically, uh, the term is prostrating yourself, not prostating yourself, not giving yourself a prostate exam either, for anyone who's getting excited. Uh, but prostrating yourself to someone who is in a more powerful position than you, humbling yourself before them and allowing yourself to grow in a relationship with them and not like a lot of people, I see them get in the room with somebody who's powerful or somebody who runs a big business or somebody they want to meet and they try to impress that person. And really all that does is shows the person that you're insecure, that you're weak, that you don't believe in yourself. If you're trying to impress somebody by showing off or saying how awesome you are, that's the number one tell that you don't believe in yourself. All that to say, this is a great example of that principle in action and what the result can be. And the first law of the 48 Laws of Power, Never Outshine the Master, really is a, in my opinion, a restatement of that commonly known idea of if you can serve someone powerful, that can come to your benefit in really, really massive ways. So Robert Eaton gives um, kind of two rules to live by at, at the end of this pretty short chapter. And they are one, you can inadvertently outshine the master simply by being yourself. Your natural talents may be so, you, you might have so much natural prowess in whatever you're doing, say it's politics, and you're somebody's aide de camp, and that politician is is maybe blundering and if you're shining you might wind up inadvertently outshining them just by nature of just being yourself so this is something that you need to be aware of whether you are intentionally trying to outshine them or not this is something you have to be aware of no matter what because as uh, stephen covey says in the the book the seven habits of highly effective people when you take an action you receive the consequence if you pick up one end of the stick you pick up the other naturally okay so that's something huge to keep in mind your natural abilities may cause you to outshine the master. The second one is that even if the master, or whoever it is in your particular situation, even if they love you, don't take that to mean that you can do anything you want. There are plenty of examples. Louis XIV even was with Fouquet, that, the story that um, Robert Greene begins this chapter with. Louis XIV and Fouquet were like this to start. He was, he was like a brother to him. He was his closest advisor. But over time, as Fouquet kept basically showing up Louis XIV, they grew more and more distant. And um, there's even, there's he gives a couple other examples of how people who are lifted from a lowly place by someone high up, they, they get a little too comfortable and they become, uh, this is the term, they become too familiar with the person of power. And then the person of power basically has to smack them down. And for many centuries, that has been meant death. Now, the present day application that I'm promising and, and beating around, <clears throat> it mostly goes for people who are in employment, who work a, a regular job and have a boss. I think that application is pretty obvious. You don't, it's not that you should intentionally do things wrong, but if you can do things to, if you have a petty boss, you know, if you have a great boss, you know, you don't even need to worry about this. But in the event that you have a petty or egotistical boss, you need to be conscious of this and you need to keep keep the, uh, the first law in mind of not outshining them, but still not screwing up in a way that ever puts you in danger, okay? So 
for entrepreneurial people, I think that this law can apply in extremely, extremely lucrative ways in the way you deal with your customers. There's, there's another law that we'll get to in later videos, but um, is that you never want to appear smarter than your mark. You want to look dumber than your mark. Uh, and that's a kind of a, a con artist term, but he uses a lot of con artist examples in his book and I personally love it because you don't really get that in a lot of other places. It's kind of like dirty and grungy, but it's applicable and it's useful and it works. But the point is there's a lot to be said for if you're trying to get someone to take a certain appropriate action, like buy a product from you, buy a course, do something that's going to benefit you in some way. If you can, again, prostrate yourself to that person, and it doesn't have to be in a way that crosses any boundaries of yours, but offer them value, make them feel good, make them feel like, you know, whatever they're, you're getting them to do would be their decision. That is a very powerful place to come from. And again, that's what we're talking about here is the laws of power and using power in a way that helps you and that really um, is, is appropriate to the goals that you're trying to accomplish and not being one of the transgressions of the laws of power that's gonna knock you off your track and make it take you even longer to get whatever it is that you want, you know? So uh, that being said, I just wanna put a little moral disclaimer at the end of this. In these videos, I'm, I'm really gonna be going over some real nitty gritty, um, some, some real down and dirty examples of how to better use power and how to manipulate power dynamics. Now, what, if you really understand this and you really apply it, you are basically going to be able to bend reality around you, okay? You're gonna be like Neo in the motherfucking matrix, like bullets are gonna be flying around your head and shit, okay? Like literally. So as you start to understand this and you, you go through these videos and you watch them and you absorb them and you start applying them, you need to do it in a judicious manner, okay? This, this is not intended to be something that's empowering to manipulators. It's not intended to be empowering to anyone who's going to do something negative with the power that you're gonna be able to achieve by not violating these principles, okay? So that said, do good things. You know, may the force be with you. May the fourth was, that, was actually yesterday, recording this on Cinco de Mayo. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Thank you for watching the vid. I would please ask that if this brought you any value at all, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, we're putting out a lot more business and just success oriented content here. We've got you know a whole video team of people behind the scenes working, editing videos almost around the clock basically at this point. I texted somebody at like 1 a.m. last night about a video we're editing and he texted me right back. So we're going ham, bringing you as much value as possible. Hit that subscribe button, smash it if that's something that you're into, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Peace. Crushed it.